Once again, we've come to the end of another liturgical year. Once again, the Church asks us to consider the end of the world. A couple points before we get into that. First, there's a whole, uh, like a flood of end of the world nonsense, Protestant errors floating around. Uh, we don't want to fall for any of that. So any, if you any have any of these kind of things around your house, you open the door of your wood stove and chuck it in. Second, the teaching of the Catholic Church is clear. There's no such thing as the rapture, and there's no such thing as the millennium, this so-called thousand-year reign of Christ our Lord. He came visibly the first time as a baby on his mission of mercy, and he'll come to us visibly and finally the second time at the end of the world as our judge. That's it. There's not like some two-and-a-half comings of our Lord. He comes twice. That's it. No rapture, no millennium, period. Third, in today's gospel and elsewhere, our Lord has commanded us to read the signs of the times. Watch ye therefore, because you know not at what hour your Lord will come. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches. Blessed is he that watches. So we're supposed to watch, but we know not the hour. So if we hear anyone setting dates when all these future things are to come to pass, we should remind ourselves of the teaching of the Fifth Lateran Council. And I quote, Preachers are in no way to presume to preach or declare a fixed time for future evils, the coming of Antichrist, or the precise day of judgment. For truth says it is not for us to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Let it be known that those who have hitherto dared to declare such things are liars, and that because of them not a little authority has been taken away from those who preach the truth. Close quote. Lateran 5. So on the one hand, we're commanded to watch the signs. On the other hand, we're reminded that we can't be completely precise since no one knows the exact dates or times, okay? Fourth point. Obviously, this is an exciting topic but we're not supposed to have some sort of chicken little the sky is falling tizzy fit when we start thinking about it. The example we should cue off of is that of St. John Birchman. St. John Birchman, that that, uh, great uh, Jesuit scholastic, it was recreation one day, and he and his fellow Jesuit scholastics were shooting pool in the recreation room. One of of them said, Hey, if you found out the world was going to end suddenly right now, what would you do? And St. John Birchman's just kept shooting pool. He said, I'd keep right on playing billiards. What's the point of the story? The point of the story is it was recreation time, so they're supposed to be recreating, and he was. He's in the state of grace, which we're supposed to be, and he was. We're spo- if we're doing our duty, and we're in the state of grace, we're where we need to be. It's not such a much of a concern of when we live in history as how we die. That's the important thing, how we die. If we die in the state of grace, we'll be saved. So we want to do our duty, stay in the state of grace and do our duty in our state in life and not have some sort of chicken little fit every time we start thinking about things like this. Let's turn to the topic. Before we do, we have to make sure we understand the meaning of the word type. What is a type? A type is a person a thing or an action that actually exists, but is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. So type is a person, thing, or action that actually exists, but it's intended by God to foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. We'll consider a few examples to see how it works. In the book of Judges, we see Jael. Now, this is the woman that saved the people of Israel. And how did she do that? Because she pondered a tenth stake through the head of a sleeping enemy general. Later in the same book, we see the woman who saved Israel when she dropped an upper millstone on the head of an em- another enemy general. In the book of Judith, we see Judith who saves Israel when she cuts the head off an enemy general. Now, in each one of these cases, there are at least three types. Obviously, Israel existed of itself, but Israel is also intended by God to prefigure the Catholic Church. So Israel is a type of the Catholic Church. The enemy generals really existed, but they were also intended by God to represent Satan and the enemies of the Church, so the enemy generals were types of the devil. 
And the women who crushed the heads of the enemy generals really existed too, but they're obviously intended by God to prefigure her. And if you look carefully at the statue, you'll see what she's doing. She's stomping on the head of a serpent. Okay, Our Lady crushes the head of a serpent. So when we consider these women and what they did for Israel, we can see foreshadowings of Our Lady and what she does for the Catholic Church. So what's a type? A type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists, but which is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow future person, thing, or action. All right, so much for the introduction. We'll turn to the topic at hand. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, St. Paul explicitly teaches that the day of the Lord, judgment day, the end of the world, can't come until there first be an apostasy, a great falling away from the true faith, a great revolt against the true faith. And that in the wake of that apostasy, the great apostasy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, be revealed. The fathers and doctors have explained what this apostasy means. For example, St. Thomas Aquinas explains that this apostasy will be separation from the faith and from obedience to the Pope. Pope St. Leo the Great teaches that indeed the great apostasy will mean abandoning the faith and obedience to the Pope. St. Augustine adds that this event must precede the coming of the Antichrist. And St. Augustine states that not all will abandon the faith, but that few will retain it. So for the next two weeks, we'll consider a historical period and a ruler with the, which the fathers and doctors have always considered to be a very clear type of the great apostasy and the Antichrist. Why would we want to study this man in his times? Because the clearer we see the foreshadowings, the clearer an idea it will give us of the actual future reality that they point towards. So today what we want to do is consider some of, more of, the, prominent, some of the more prominent features of the apostasy which took place in Jerusalem around 170 B.C., and next week we'll consider the man who's such a clear type of the Antichrist. We'll do this by first uh, reading lines from the Holy Scriptures. It's found in the inspired books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And then we'll reflect on the meanings of those scriptures by turning to the great commentary, great scriptural commentary. It was prepared some 400 years ago by a saintly Belgian Jesuit, Father Cornelius de Lapide, who at the order of the Pope spent some 40 years assembling the works of the Church Fathers into a massive 21-volume, line-by-line commentary on the scriptures. So we'll get started. The inspired word of God, quote, In those days there went out of Israel wicked men, and they persuaded many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the heathens that are round about us. And some of the people determined to do this. Close quote. Cornelius Lapidae commenting on that line. The leader of the wicked men was Jason, who treacherously managed to seize the high priesthood for himself. Why? So that he might introduce Gentile rituals and customs, and especially false religions and idolatry into Judea, and pursue the attending unrestrained, unbridled, open lusts. So what's happening here? We see that those with the true faith, instead of carefully, even scrupulously, remaining faithful to God, and avoiding any pagan practices and trying to convert their pagan neighbors by their example and by their words. Instead, they're turning away from their holy religion and allowing themselves to become paganized. Notice also that the leaders are priests. It's one good priest I know likes to point out. Whenever you see the church go down, it's an inside job. Notice also that we see here a link between false religions idolatry, heresy, and lust. The inspired word of God. And they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the laws of the nations. Close quote. So they built a gymnasium in the holy city. And you might think, so what? It might help to know that what we mean by gymnasium is not what it meant in those days. Gymnos is a Greek word for naked. It was a place to exercise buck naked. So much for modesty but think of where they're at. Not only are they in the Holy Land, they're right there in the Holy City. But there are more details we find in sacred scripture about this. This will be slightly edited and paraphrased, uh, not because I want to be God's editor, but because it needs to be because of the youngsters. 
Quote, the high priest Jason began to bring over his countrymen to the fashion of the heathens. And he abolished the lawful ordinances of the citizens and brought in fashions that were perverse. For he had the boldness to set up a gymnasium and to put all the choicest youths in certain types of houses. Close quote. Now I have to have an even more highly paraphrased uh, version of Cornelius Lapidus' commentary. Not only did the youth learn the Greek games, such as the discus, etc., but also they were corrupted by being taught all types of perverse sins. They were certain types of clothing as a sign of types of immodest behavior. They were consecrated to pagan gods, in other words, devils, such as Astarte or Venus. The houses they lived in were connected to taverns. Actually, the whole thing is so bad, I don't even like reading it in Latin. Cornelius, Sodopity, back to him. Here we're taught that just as the true religion is associated with purity and chastity, so impurities and lust are associated with false religions and heresy. So as the apostasy progresses, we see immodesty and nakedness and perverse behavior. You might just think of San Francisco and Boston. Another slightly edited and paraphrased quote from the inspired word of God. Now this was not the beginning, but an increase in progress of heathenist practices through the abominable and unheard of wickedness of Jason, that impious wretch and no priest. It grew so bad that the priests were not now occupied about the offices of the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partakers of the games and of the unlawful allowances thereof. And disdaining the honors of their fathers, they esteemed the Grecian glories for the best, and they followed earnestly the heathen customs, and in all things they coveted to be like them, who were their enemies and murderers. It grew so bad that priests were not not occupied about the offices of the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partakers of the unlawful allowances. And Coinus Elapide enlightens us, quote, The allowances were called unlawful because these were young, shameless, lewd women. Close quote. So the priests abandoned and despised their priestly duties, Remember that a vast number of the sacrifices they're neglecting are sin offerings. Priests begin to act like heathens. They start running around to the most foul worldly entertainments and running around with companions with loose morals. We continue. Word of God. Quote, The temple was full of the riot and revelings of the Gentiles and of men sinning with lewd women. Close quote. So you have parties, pagan rites, and lewd behavior going on in the holiest place in the universe. The inspired word of God. Quote, and women thrust themselves of their accord into the holy places. Close quote. Well, of course, uh, since the very beginning, since the time of Adam and the true worship of God, women have always been forbidden from this kind of behavior. In the temple, if a woman were to go into any of the holy places proper to the priests, the strict duty of the Levites was to kill her. There's plenty more, but we can get the general picture. Let's remember what a type is. A type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists, which is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. Now keep in mind that the apostasy at the time of the Maccabees is a type of the great apostasy, In other words, it gives us a prefigurement of the great apostasy, and all the fathers have seen this. Among other things, the Jewish people prefigure the Catholic people. The Jewish priests prefigure the Catholic priests. The Jewish temple prefigures the Catholic church and parishes, and the city of Jerusalem prefigures the world. So based on the indications we've seen in the prefigurement of the apostasy during the fulfillment in other words, in the great apostasy itself, here are a few of the things that we might expect to see. A dramatic rise in imos behavior and dress and perverse behaviors, most notably certain politically correct sins and those associated with Boston. Catholics abandoning the true faith, the traditions of their fathers, and turning to false religions, paganism, and worldliness. Catholic priests neglecting their priestly duties. 
especially the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and the application of the once-for-all sin offering to sinners in the confessional. Catholic priests engaged in worldly entertainments, spending time in the company of companions with loose morals. Women invading the sanctuaries of the true religion. The behavior inside Catholic churches becoming increasingly unbecoming, disruptive, and irreverent. So, if we were heeding our Lord's command to watch, these would be some of the indicators we would be watching for. We need to keep in mind that our Lord has actually appointed official watchmen to keep us posted. Let's hear from them, because they have the office to watch. The first two quotes have been edited for the sake of time. Quote, Who can fail to see that society is, at the present time, more than in any past age, suffering from a terrible and deep-rooted malady which, developing every day and eating into its inmost being, is dragging it to destruction? You understand, venerable brethren, what this disease is, apostasy from God. There is a sacrilegious war which is now almost everywhere, stirred up and fomented against God. And we find extinguished in the vast majority of men all respect for the eternal God and no regard paid in public or private life to God's holy will. Instead, every effort is used to utterly destroy the memory and knowledge of God. When all this is considered, there is good reason to fear, lest this great perversity may be, as it were, a foretaste and perhaps the beginning of those evils which are reserved for the last days. And that there may already be in the world the son of perdition of whom the apostle speaks in Second Thessalonians 2.3. Such in truth is the audacity and the wrath employed everywhere in persecuting religion, in combating the dogmas of the faith, in brazen effort to uproot and destroy all relations between man and the divinity. Well, on the other hand, and this, according to the same apostle, is the distinguishing mark of Antichrist, man has with infinite arrogance put himself in the place of God, raising himself above all that is called God in such wise that he has mocked God's majesty and, as it were, made of the universe a temple wherein he himself is to be adored. He sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. Second Thessalonians 2.2. 2. Close quote. Pope St. Pius X, First Encyclical, October 1903. Second quote, quote, Everyone should examine the world seated in wickedness, First John 5.19, with his eyes and with his mind. Young people are induced to renounce Christ, to blaspheme and to attempt the worst crimes of lust. The whole Christian people are constantly in danger of falling away from the faith. These things, in truth, are so sad that you might say that such events foreshadow and portend the beginning of sorrows. That is to say, of those that shall be brought by the man of sin, who is lifted above all that is called God or is worshipped, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. But is yet more to be lamented, lamented, venerable brethren, that among the faithful themselves there are found so many men who are laboring under an incredible ignorance of divine things and who are infected with false doctrines who lead a life of vice without the light of the true faith, so that they truly seem to sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. There's a greatly increasing carelessness concerning church rules and discipline. Now, those ancient traditions by which family life is governed and the sanctity of marriage is safeguarded. The education of children is altogether neglected or else it is depraved. There's a sad forgetfulness of Christian modesty, especially in the life and dress of women. There's an unbridled desire for material goods, and lastly, a contempt for the word of God, whereby faith itself is injured or endangered. But all these evils, as it were, culminate in the evil of those who, following the example of the traitor Judas, either receive Holy Communion rashly and sacrilegiously, or else go over to the camp of the enemy. And thus, even against our will, the thought rises in the mind that now those days draw near of which our Lord prophesied. Because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. Matthew 
2412. Close quote. Pope Pius XI, Encyclical on Reparation of the Sacred Heart, May 1928. So an encyclical was written roughly 100 years ago and 80 years ago. The popes explicitly warned us it may very well be the beginning of the end. Since then, quote, We are overwhelmed with sadness and anguish, seeing that the wickedness of perverse men has reached a degree of impiety that is unbelievable and absolutely unknown in other times. Close quote. Pius XII, 1949. Quote, Venerable brethren, you are well aware that almost the whole human race is today allowing itself to be driven into two opposing camps, for Christ or against Christ. The human race is involved today in a supreme crisis which will issue in its salvation by Christ or in its dire destruction. Close quote. Pius XII, 1951. Quote, I sometimes read the gospel passages of the end times, and I attest that at this time some signs of this end are emerging. Close quote. Pope Paul VI, 1977. End quote. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith in our countries, in this Europe of Christian tradition? This is an open question, which clearly reveals the depth and the drama of one of the most serious challenges which we are called to face. European culture gives the impression of silent apostasy on the part of people who have all that they need and who live as if God does not exist. Close quote. Blessed John Paul II, 2003. Okay, for a full century, the popes have been reading the signs of the times and warning us warning us that things are grinding to a close. So what are we supposed to do? Remember that God's in charge. He loves us. He knows exactly when he wants each one of us to live. We don't want to imitate Chicken Little. We want to imitate St. John Birchman's. We need to do our duty in our state and life. We need to get serious about our faith. Serious about personal holiness. Say rosary and three Hail Marys every day. No exceptions. Wear your brown scapular. Stop sinning. Go to confession at least every two weeks. Make fervent communions. Spend time before our Lord in the most blessed sacrament. Put God first. Become holy. Do your duty. It's pretty basic. Everybody just has to do his duty. Now let's take a look today at the ruler who prefigures the Antichrist, whose name is Antiochus Epiphanes. After Alexander the Great died in 323 B.C., his kingdom was split into four parts. At the time of the Maccabees, which was some 150 years after Alexander's death, the part of his kingdom which included the Holy Land was ruled by Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a Greek king of Syria. Today we'll consider certain features of his rule uh, by reading lines from the inspired uh, books of First and Second Maccabees. Uh, now keep in mind there's a lot more there than what we'll be able to cover in the time we've got, and as usual we'll do a lot of cutting and splicing. After we read some scripture, then once again for comments we'll turn to the great commentary by Father Quinius Elapide. So let's get started. The inerrant, inspired word of God. And some of the Jewish people determined to make a covenant with the heathens and went to the king, Antiochus Epiphanes, and he authorized them to follow the ordinances of the heathens. Now, who went to Antiochus Epiphanes with this request? Quinius Lapide, quote, The leader of the wicked men was Jason, who treacherously managed to seize the high priesthood for himself. Close quote. So here we see ambitious apostate priests paving the way for the tyrannical rule of Antiochus Epiphanes and his paganism. Last week we saw the state that the people fell into, uh, this resulting apostasy. Then suddenly, in the midst of all apostasy, there appeared terrors from heaven and great signs. The inspired and inerrant word of God, quote, And it came to pass that through the whole city of Jerusalem, for the space of forty days, there were seen horsemen running in the air, 
in gilded raiment and armed with spears like bands of soldiers, and horses set in order by ranks, running one against another with the shakings of shields and a multitude of men in helmets with drawn swords and casting of darts and glittering of golden armor and of harnesses of all sorts. Wherefore all men prayed that these prodigies might turn to good. Close quote. Cornelius Lapide comments on this, quote, Indeed, this portent was done by the angels at the command of God, that through these things God might warn the Jews beforehand about the attack soon to be made upon them by Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so now that the Lord has warned everybody about the upcoming attack, Antiochus Epiphanes arrives on the scene in Jerusalem, the inspired inner word of God. Quote, and Antiochus went up to Jerusalem with a great multitude, and he took the city by force of arms. And he commanded the soldiers to kill and not to spare any that came in their way, and to go up into the houses to slay. Thus there was a slaughter of young and old, a destruction of women and children, and killing of virgins and infants. And there were slain in the space of three whole days 80,000. 40,000 were made prisoners and as many sold as slaves. Close quote. That's still not all. The word of God. Quote, but this was not enough. Antiochus Epiphanes presumed also to enter into the temple, the most holy in all the world. And taking in his wicked hands the holy vessels, he unworthily handled and profaned them. And he proudly entered into the sanctuary and took away the golden altar and the candlestick of light and all the vessels, and the veil, and the crowns, and the golden ornament that was before the temple. And he broke them all in pieces. And he took the silver and gold and the precious vessels, and he took the hidden treasures which he found. And when he had taken all away, he departed into his own country. Close quotes. So here we see the iconoclasm of Antiochus Epiphanes as he sacks the temple. Iconoclasm is the deliberate destruction of religious artwork and symbols, Why does God allow this arrogant pagan to profane and strip the temple? The inspired word of God gives us the answer. God was angry for a while because of the sins of the inhabitants of the city. And therefore this contempt had happened to the place, and the holy place itself shared in the evils of the people. Close quote. The Hadok commentary. Temples and sacrifices are for our own advantage. God has often suffered sacred places to be profaned when piety had been disregarded. What's the point? As we saw last week, instead of being pious, instead of clinging to the true faith, in large part, the Jewish priests and people had become apostate. The Hadot Commentary, quote, All religious rites are designed for God's glory and man's welfare. Hence, when they cease to serve God, the holy things are destroyed or taken away. All religious rites are designed for God's glory and man's welfare. Hence, when they cease to serve God, the holy things are destroyed or taken away. The holy things are destroyed or taken away when they're no longer used for God's glory and the welfare of man. It's a very serious message here for each one of us. This beautiful liturgy, our holy faith, all this is ours to lose. It's ours to lose. If we're not pious, if we're not serious about avoiding sacrilegious communions and every kind of irreverent behavior and training the children in that way too, God will take this all away. And that means all of it. He's done it before. He'll do it again. That's not a prophecy, it's a certainty. God means what he says, and he won't be mocked or trifled with for long. So far, we've seen death and profanation the stripping of the temple. It gets worse. Inspired word of God. And King Antiochus wrote to all his kingdom that all the people should be one, and everyone should leave his own law. And many of Israel consented to his service, and they sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And that whosoever would not do this should be put to death. And many of Israel consented. And when the feast of Bacchus was kept, the Jews were compelled to go about crowned with ivy in honor of Bacchus. 
and whosoever would not conform themselves to the ways of the Gentiles should be put to death. Here we see the exclusive claims of the one true religion being put to the test. We also see many of the Jews becoming actual pagan idolaters. Cornelius Lapide. Antiochus commanded that there should be uniformity in faith and religion, so that all the people would be united in the same superstitions and idolatry, just as they were all united in the same kingdom. And therefore, the Jews should abandon the laws and the worship of God handed down to Moses and defile themselves with sacrilegious sacrifices and the superstitions and idols of the Gentiles. And when the Bacchanalia, that is, the Feast of Bacchus, was celebrated with drinking, dancing, public spectacles, impurities, and all the sins of the flesh, the Jews were forced to wear crowns of ivy in honor of Bacchus and to go around the temple or the city. Close quotes. Now, what is the Bacchanalia? The pagan uh, Roman historian Livy has a description of the Bacchanalian rites, which, with some editing, can be uh, read aloud. Quote, To the religious performances in the Bacchanalia, to the religious performances were added the pleasures of wine and feasting, when wine, lascivious discourse, night, and the mingling of the sexes had extinguished every sentiment of modesty, then debaucheries of every kind began to be practiced, as every person found at hand that sort of enjoyment to which he was disposed by the passion predominant in his nature. Nor were they confined to one kind of vice. On account of the loud shouting and the noise of drums and cymbals, none of the cries uttered by the person suffering violation or murder could be heard abroad. Close quote. That's the Bacchanalia. It gets worse. The inspired word of God. King Antiochus set up the abominable idol of desolation upon the altar of God. And they built altars throughout all the cities of Judah round about. And they cut in pieces and burnt with fire the books of the law of God. And everyone with whom the books of the testament of the Lord were found, and whosoever observed the law of the Lord, they put to death according to the edict of the king. And they sacrificed upon the altar of the idol that was over against the altar of God. Close quote. Cornelius Lapide, quote, For Antiochus wished to abolish the worship of the true God and force the Jews to adore his idol. For Antiochus wished to be worshipped as being one with the God Jove himself. Not only did he want to force them to turn away from the worship of God to the worship of Jove, at the same time he wanted to seduce them to commit impurities, which is plainly the work of the devil. Therefore, Antiochus ordered that the idol of Jove be placed in the temple dedicated by a solemn rite and adored, and from thence be called the Temple of Jove. On this altar they sacrificed not only to Jove, but also to Antiochus himself, as if he were a god. For he himself wished to be worshipped as a god, just as was predicted by the prophet Daniel. Therefore Antiochus is a type of the Antichrist. Behold, this is indeed the abomination of desolation, that is, the idolatrous abomination which makes all things desolate, predicted more than 300 years before by the prophet Daniel. Close quotes. So there we see the abomination of desolation in the temple, a pagan idol, a demon worshipped by the pagans, is set up in the temple of the true God, and false worship and sacrifices are offered to it. Now there's plenty more that can be said about the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, but we've seen enough to get the general picture. Now remember what a type is. A type is a person, thing, or an action that actually exists, but it's also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. So based on the indications we've seen in the prefigurement of both the great apostasy and the Antichrist, and since our Lord has commanded us to read the signs of the times, watch ye therefore, because you know not at what hour your Lord will come. Behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth. Here are a few signs that Catholics might want to be on the lookout for. Sign. The behavior inside Catholic churches becoming increasingly unbecoming, disruptive, and irreverent. Catholics abandoning the true faith and traditions of their fathers, turning to false religions, paganism, worldliness. Bunk, amongst both the laity and priests, a dramatic rise in immodest dress, behavior, and perversities. Most notably, certainly politically correct sins and those associated with Boston. Sign. 
Catholic priests neglecting their priestly duties, especially the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the application of the once-for-all sin offering to sinners in the confessional. Sign. Sign and portents in the sky. It is true that we haven't seen anything like the angelic battle seen in the skies over Jerusalem. But it is interesting that in those days our Lord states that the sun shall be darkened. St. Augustine explains one of the spiritual meanings of our Lord's statement. St. Augustine, quote, The sun, that is to say the church, shall be darkened. Because in those tremendous temptations and tribulations which shall be in the end of the world, many who had seemed as bright and as firm as the sun and stars shall fall from the faith. Close quote. In today's gospel, when our Lord speaks of signs in the sun and the, the powers of heaven shall be shaken, it's hard not to think of Fatima. Sign, the occupation of Jerusalem. In Luke 21, 24, now that's the line found immediately before today's gospel. Our Lord states, quote, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles till the time of the nations be fulfilled, close quote. Cornelius Elapide, quote, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles till the time of the nations be fulfilled. That is to say, till the end of the world and of all nations. As the Venerable Bede states, until the plenitude of the Gentiles shall enter into the Church of Christ. For Christ has regard to the desolation of Jerusalem. This was foretold by Daniel in chapter 9, where it is said, The desolation shall continue unto the consummation in the end, meaning that Jerusalem after being razed to the ground and laid desolate by Titus, shall no longer be the capital city of the Jews, but shall belong to the Gentiles, and after that to the Christians, and after that to the Saracens and the Turks, as it is at present. Now, he's writing uh, 400 years ago. And, of course, uh, Jerusalem was trodden down by the Gentiles for some 19 centuries, right up until uh, the Six-Day War in 1967. Uh, Back to Cornelius Elapidae. And this state of things shall continue until the end of the world. When Antichrist, the King and Messiah of the Jews, shall fix the seat of his empire at Jerusalem, as is plain from Apocalypse 11.8. And then shall Enoch and Elias resist Antichrist and convert many of the Jews to Christ. After Antichrist is slain, all the Jews shall be brought to Christ by the disciples of Enoch and Elias and shall publicly worship Christ in Jerusalem, as may be easily gathered from Apocalypse 28. Close quote. Sign, the wholesale martyrdom, slaughter of Catholics. More Catholics have been martyred in the past hundred years than the total from all the previous 19 centuries. Sign, the moral corruption and degradation of our youth. It hardly bears comment. It's already almost beyond belief. Uh, The schools are are just one of many examples. Just think about the new uh, rainbow curriculum that's mandatory in Catholic public schools. I was on the Texans for Co-Life Coalition website yesterday, and it reports that in Catholic schools in Houston, Galveston, and San Antonio, quote, a new uh, immoral education curriculum aimed at grammar school children has been adopted by the local authorities. In terms that rival the boldness and indecency of Planned Parenthood, Explicit material is offered to children as young as five years old. Close quote. And the universities are certainly part of the program as well. The Alliance Defense Fund reports that a student at Georgia Tech who had been mocked, cursed, and threatened with rape and murder for standing up for her faith and conservative views on campus, she was told by one of the deans that, quote, students have been indoctrinated for 18 years of their lives by their parents and their churches, and we only have four years to undo the damage. Close quote. Sign, punishment and persecution for keeping the laws of God. Again, uh, you hardly need the priest to point any of this out. One example, I think it's a sign of things to come, will suffice. Quote, a young Christian photographer was reported to the New Mexico Civil Rights Commission, tried, found guilty in order to pay nearly $7,000 in attorney's fees after she respectfully declined to photograph the commitment ceremony of a certain couple, despite the fact that neither of these types of utterly immoral marriages nor civil unions are legal in New Mexico, close quote. To say nothing of the fact that uh, these are one of the four sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance. 
sign, a wholesale rise in the worship of Bacchus. Remember that the pagan feast of Bacchus, the Bacchanalia, celebrated with drinking, dancing, public spectacles, impurities, all the sins of the flesh. This sort of drunken debauchery, the Bacchanalia, is easy to find. It's just been electrified. It's a whole culture of rock and roll, nightclubs, MTV, etc. Sign, a push towards a united one world religion, which of course is not the true religion. On that note, the URI, it's the United Religions Initiative, it's founded in 1995 uh, with the goal of making a spiritual equivalent of the United Nations, and it accompanies, which is supposed to encompass all religions and all types of spirituality. All types of spirituality. The stated goals of the URI include peace and unity among religions, social justice, preservation of the environment. At the 1997 URI Summit Conference, a public worship service included a procession of 15 banners with symbols representing the world's religion, including a banner for the Wiccans, the neo-pagan witchcraft movement. The 15th banner on it had an empty silver circle representing the religions which are to come. Uh, we shouldn't be alarmed by any of this, but we should pay attention. Sign, false idolatrous worship in Catholic churches, erecting of idols in Catholic churches and worship being given them. Now, this sort of thing is cropping up uh, more and more often, and not just in the chapels of female religious communities that have lost their way. Of course, everyone here is, uh, I'm sure, is familiar with the astonishing example in Assisi on October 27, 1986, when the Dalai Lama and a group of his Tibetan Buddhist monks placed a statue of the Buddha on top of the tabernacle, and they placed this lotus uh, flower-shaped censer in front of the tabernacle, on the side, one side of the tabernacle, they had this banner with Buddhist, I don't know what, on it. And then two pagan books, uh, two Buddhist books on either side of the tabernacle. And then they bowed down in front of the altar and did some sort of pagan Buddhist ceremony. Now, by the way, if you want to see the actual examples, real examples of the bronze idols that Tibetan Buddhists uh, pray to, there's an absolutely remarkable exhibit of them in the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Uh, if you go to look at them, you must be careful that your children do not look at them. Another example springs to mind. It took place exactly one month ago today in the Basilica of St. Mary the Angel in Assisi on the 25th anniversary of the first meeting there. A Nigerian named Wanda Ombimbla. Now, he's a former Harvard professor, uh, which is fitting, and a current high priest of the Yoruba religion. Uh, we should read that witch doctor. This witch doctor took the occasion to lecture the Pope and others present. And here's what the witch doctor had to say. Quote, The time has come for the leaders of all the world's religions to have a new frame of mind in which indigenous religions are given the same respect and consideration as other religions. Close quote. Well, thanks a lot. Doctor, This moral advice coming from the high priest of a religion which traditionally not only sacrifices animals, but also humans. Then he took the occasion to shake a rattle and sing some sort of song, hymn, incantation, curse, I don't know, take your choice, in honor of one of the demons he worships, which is supposed he believes is chained uh, to the bottom of the ocean. Well, he's chained all right, but it's a little deeper than the bottom of the ocean. Anyway, uh, over here, this Yoruba religion, of which this guy is a witch doctor, over here, in the Spanish-speaking parts of the world, it's called Santeria, and in the Portuguese parts of the world, it's Candelombe or Macombe. Uh, Father Gabriel Amorth, he's the retired uh, former chief exorcist in Rome, the most experienced uh, exorcist in the world, uh, points out that the very most difficult cur- curses for an exorcist to break are those that are done through voodoo. Now, voodoo comes, th- this guy's from Nigeria, and right next door where his tribe, the tribe he's from, is Benin, where voodoo, that's, that's from tribes right there in Benin. And the ones that are from voodoo or from Yoruba. Those are the two hardest curses for exorcists to break in the world. And we have guys like this giving us moral advice in Catholic churches. Thanks a lot. What are we to think of this? Let's check with God. Psalm 95, 5, quote, All the gods of the Gentiles are devils. Close quote, God the Holy Ghost. Sign, profanation and stripping of the beauty, sacred vessels, and treasures found in Catholic churches. 
How many churches have been recovated? Beautiful marble altars smashed. Chalices, monstrances, relics, statues thrown away. Cornelius de Lapide has a most interesting and alarming observation that's worth pondering very carefully. Quote, Morally, the abomination of desolation is sacrilege and heresy, especially iconoclasm. For heresy is an idol abominable to God, which brings around the desolation of kingdoms and peoples and the yoke of the Turk. By the yoke of the Turk, he means invasion of Islam. This is worth repeating. Morally, the abomination of desolation is sacrilege sacrilege and heresy, especially iconoclasm. For heresy is an idol abominable to God, which brings about the destruction of kingdoms and peoples and the yoke of the Turk. For when heretics, especially iconoclasts, violate consecrated churches and break the images of the saints and profane the holy places, then it is certain that the desolation and devastation of the people is eminent. God avenges sacrilege in the violation of his divine majesty, worship, and religion. Close quote. When heretics, especially iconoclasts, violate consecrated churches and break the images of the saints, and profane the holy places, then it is certain that the devastation and desolation of the people is imminent. God avenges sacrilege in the violation of his divine majesty, worship, and religion. So if we were heeding our Lord's command to watch, those are a few of the signs we might want to watch for. Popes have already given us a fairly decent idea of where in history we're living. Now what are we supposed to do? We want to remember that God's in charge. He loves us. He knows exactly when in history he wanted each one of us to live. We don't need to imitate Chicken Little. We each need to do our duty in our state of life. We need to get serious about the commandments. We need to get serious about our faith. We need to get serious about our personal holiness. Say your rosary and your three Hail Marys in your prayers every day. No exceptions. Wear your brown scapular. Stop sinning. Go to confession every two weeks. Make fervent communions. Spend time before our Lord in the most blessed sacrament of the altar. Put God first and become holy. It's pretty basic. Get serious about your faith. Stay in the state of grace and do your duty. Just do your duty. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, St. Paul explicitly warns and teaches that the day of the Lord The judgment day, the end of the world, can't come unless first there be an apostasy, a great falling away from the faith, a great rebellion from the true faith. And then in the wake of that apostasy, the great apostasy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, be revealed. The fathers and doctors have explained what this apostasy means. For example, St. Thomas explains that this apostasy will be separation from the faith, and from obedience to the Pope. Pope St. Leo the Great teaches that indeed the great apostasy will mean abandoning of faith and obedience to the Pope. St. Augustine adds that this event must precede the coming of the Antichrist. And St. Augustine adds that not all will abandon the faith, but few will retain it. For the next two weeks, we'll consider a historical period and a ruler that the fathers and doctors of the Church have always considered to be very clear types of the great apostasy and antichrist. Okay, now why would we want to study this man in his times? Because the clearer we see the foreshadowings, the clearer an idea it will give us of the actual future realities that they point towards. Okay?
So today what we want to do is consider some of the more prominent features of the apostasy in Jerusalem which happened around 170 B.C. We'll do this first by reading lines from the Holy Scriptures found in inspired books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees, and then we'll turn to that great scriptural commentary by Father Cornelius Elapidae. Let's get started. The inspired word of God, quote, In those days there went out of Israel wicked men, and they persuaded many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the heathens that are round about us. And some of the people determined to do this. Close quote. Cornelius Elapidae. The leader of the wicked men was Jason, who treacherously managed to seize the high priesthood for himself. Why? So that into Judea he might introduce Gentile rituals and customs, and especially false religions and idolatry, and the attending unrestrained, unbridled, open lusts. Close quote. What's happening here? we see that those with the true faith, instead of carefully and scrupulously remaining faithful to God and avoiding pagan practices and trying to convert their pagan neighbors by example and word, are actually turning away from their holy religion and allowing themselves to become paganized. Notice also that the leaders were priests. As a good priest, I know likes to point out, whenever you see the church go down, it's always an inside job. Notice also there's a link between false religions, idolatry, heresy, and lust. Inspired word of God. And they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the laws of the nations. They built a gymnasium in the holy city. So what, Father? Every school has a gymnasium these days. Yes, but what we mean by gymnasium is not what they meant by gymnasium. It's a different meaning. Gymnos is the Greek word for naked. It was a place for naked exercises, among other things. So much for modesty. Now think of where they're at. Not only are they in the Holy Land, but they're in the Holy City. More details from sacred scripture. This is slightly edited and paraphrased. Quote, The high priest Jason began to bring over his countrymen to the fashion of the heathens. And he abolished the lawful ordinances of the citizens and brought in fashions that were perverse. For he had the boldness to set up a gymnasium and to put all the choicest youths in certain types of houses. Close quote. Now this will be a very highly paraphrased version of the commentary. Not only did this, the youth learn the Greek games such as the discus and so forth, but they were also corrupted by being taught all kinds of perversities. There were certain types of clothing as a sign of the types of immodest behavior. They were consecrated to pagan gods, which is to say demons, such as Astarte or Venus. The houses they lived in were connected to taverns. Actually, this whole commentary at this point is so bad, I don't even like reading it. It's written in Latin. Quote, here we're taught from the commentary, quote, here we're taught that just as a true religion is associated with purity and chastity, so impurities and lust are associated with false religions and heresy. Close quote. So as this apostasy progresses, we see immodesty, nakedness, and perverse behavior that might bring San Francisco and Boston to mind. Another slightly edited and paraphrased quote from the inspired word of God. Now this was not the beginning, but an increase and in progress of heathenness practices through the abominable and unheard of wickedness of Jason that impious wretch and no priest. It grew so bad that the priests were now not occupied about the offices of the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, they hastened to be partakers of the games and of the unlawful allowances thereof. And disdaining the honors of their fathers, they esteemed Grecian glories for the best. They followed earnestly the heathen customs and all things they coveted to be like them who were their enemies and murderers." Close quote. It grew so bad that the priests were now not occupied about the offices of the altar, but despised the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partakers of the unlawful allowances. Cornelius Elapidae, quote, The allowances were called unlawful because these were young, shameless, lewd women. Close quote. So the priests abandoned and despised their priestly duties, 
remember that a vast number of the sacrifices they were to offer up and they're, they're neglecting their sin offerings. They begin to act like heathens and they start running around. They're running to the most foul kind of entertainment and with companions that have loose morals. The inspired word of God, quote, The temple was full of the riot and revelings of the Gentiles. Close quote. So you have parties and pagan rites going on in the holiest place in the universe. The inspired word of God, quote, And women thrust themselves of their accord into the holy places. Close quote. Of course, since the beginning, since the time of Adam, the true worship of God, women were forbidden from this kind of behavior. In the temple, if a woman were to go into any of the holy places proper to the priests, the strict duty of the Levites was to kill her. There's plenty more, but we can all get the general picture. Now remember what a type is. A type is any person, thing, or action that actually exists but which is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. Keep in mind that this apostasy is a type of the great apostasy. In other words, it gives us a prefigurement. Among other things, the Jewish people prefigure the Catholic people. The Jewish priests prefigure the Catholic priests. The Jewish temple prefigures the Catholic church and Catholic parishes. The city of Jerusalem prefigures the world. So based on the indications we've seen in the prefigurement of the apostasy, in the fulfillment, in the great apostasy itself, here's a few of the things we might anticipate seeing. A dramatic rise in immodest behavior and dress and perverse behaviors, most notably certainly politically correct, certain politically correct sins and those things associated with Boston. Catholics abandoning the true faith and the traditions of their fathers and turning to false religions, paganism, and worldliness. Catholic priests neglecting their priestly duties, especially the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the application of the once-for-all sin offering to sinners in the confessional. Catholic priests engaged in worldly entertainments and spending their time in the company of those with loose morals. Women invading the sanctuaries of the holy religion. The behavior inside Catholic churches becoming increasingly unbecoming, disruptive, and irreverent. So if we were heeding our Lord's command to watch, those would be some of the indicators that we should watch for. We also need to keep in mind that our Lord has appointed official watchmen to keep us posted. Let's hear from them. For the sake of time, the first two quotes have been edited. Quote, Who can fail to see that society is at the present time, more than any past age, suffering from a terrible and deep-rooted malady, which developing every day and eating into its inmost being is dragging it to destruction? You understand, Venerable Brethren, what this disease is. Apostasy from God. There is a sacrilegious war which is now, almost everywhere, stirred up and fomented against God. And we find extinguished among the majority of men all respect for the eternal God and no regard paid in public or private life to God's holy will. Instead, every effort is used to destroy utterly the memory and the knowledge of God. When all this is considered, there's good reason to fear, lest this great perversity may be, as it were, a foretaste, and perhaps the beginning of those evils which are reserved for the last days. There may already in the world the son of perdition of whom the apostle speaks in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Such in truth is the audacity and wrath employed everywhere in persecuting religion, in combating the dogmas of faith, in brazen effort to uproot and destroy all relations between man and God. Well, on the one hand, on the other hand, and this according to the same apostle, is the distinguishing mark of Antichrist, man has with infinite arrogance, put himself in the place of God, raising himself above all that is called God in such a way that he has mocked God's majesty and, as it were, made of the universe a temple wherein he himself is to be adored. He sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. Second Thessalonians. Close quote. From the first encyclical of Pope St. Pius X, on the restoration of all things in Christ, 4th October, 1903.
Quote, everyone should examine the world seated in wickedness with his eyes and with his mind. Young people are induced to renounce Christ, to blaspheme and to attempt the worst crimes of lust. The whole Christian people are continually in danger of falling away from the faith. These things in truth are so sad that you might say that such events foreshadow and portend the beginning of sorrows. That is to say, of those things that shall be brought on by the man of sin, who is lifted up above all that is called God or is worshipped. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 But it is yet more to be lamented, venerable brethren, that among the faithful themselves there are found so many men who are laboring under an incredible ignorance of divine things and who are infected with false doctrines, who lead a life of vice without the light of the true faith, so that they seem truly to sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. There's a greatly increasing carelessness concerning church rules and discipline and of those ancient traditions by which family life is governed and by which the sanctity of marriage is safeguarded. The education of children is altogether neglected or else it is depraved. There's a sad forgetfulness of Christian modesty, especially in the life and dress of women. There's an unbridled desire for material goods. And lastly, a contempt for the word of God, whereby faith itself is injured or endangered. But all these evils, as it were, culminate in the evil of those who follow the example of the traitor Judas, either receive Holy Communion rashly and sacrilegiously, or else go over to the camp of the enemy. And thus, even against our own will, the thought rises in the mind that now those days draw near of which our Lord prophesied. And because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. Close quote. Pope Pius XI, on reparation to the Sacred Heart, May 5th, 1928. So encyclicals written roughly 175 years ago, the popes explicitly warned Catholics that it may be the beginning of the end. And since then, quote, we are overwhelmed with sadness and anguish, seeing that the wickedness of perverse men has reached a degree of impiety that is unbelievable and absolutely unknown in other times. Pope Pius XII, 1949. I, some, quote, I sometimes read the gospel passage of end times, and I attest that at this time some times, signs of this end are emerging. Pope Pius VI, or Pope Paul VI, 1977. Quote, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between a church and the anti-church of the gospel versus the anti-gospel. Carol Cardinal Wojtyla, 1976, shortly before he became a Holy Father, John Paul II. And of course, this last year we had the Holy Father speaking explicitly about the silent apostasy, which is totally afflicting Europe. He made these remarks on several different occasions. Okay, so for a century the popes have been reading the signs of the times and warning us that things are grinding to a close. We've got a pretty fair notion of approximately where in history we're living. Now what are we supposed to do? Let's remember God's in charge. He loves us. He knows everything. He knows exactly when in history he wanted each one of us to be born, to live, and to die. He's in charge. Let's not imitate Chicken Little. Let's imitate St. John Bursman's. We each need to do our duty in our state in life. Our duty in our state in life. I have a particular state in life, and you do too. And what will we be judged principally on? How well we did the duties for our state in life. We need to get serious about our faith if we haven't been. We need to get serious about holiness. Say your rosary and your three Hail Marys every day. Say your prayers, wear your brown scapular, stop sinning. We're sinners, identify where your problems are, and knock it off. Go to confession about every two weeks, make fervent communions, put God first, and become holy. 
Do your duty. It's pretty basic. Do your duty. <laughs>